Building the bioheat bridge. Um, you know, I wonder if, if, I, if I asked that question this morning before we all came here, what that might mean to you, whether or not there might be an obvious answer. And I, and I think if I did, there probably would be one. The simple act of blending ASTM D396 heating oil with ASTM D6751 biodiesel. But I hope when you leave here today, after you've heard all these wonderful speakers and you've taken the tour of City Field, that on the ride home you think that there may be some other bridges that you can build in your business as well by leveraging biodiesel into your business plan. So that's kind of what our hope is, the takeaway is that yes, it is the blending these two fuels, but maybe it's, there's a little bit more to this as well, and that's what I'm gonna hopefully try to make the case for today. So with all the nice things that we've heard about today, we're running businesses, and this has to make business sense. And that's hopefully what we're gonna kinda come across here now. And, and w in looking at this, what I kinda look at is growing the value of the biodiesel gallon. Some of them are obvious. The positive consumer marketing messaging of biodiesel, the environmental benefits, the fact that it's domestically produced, the fact that there's greater lubricity in biodiesel, which we're losing with the new ultra-low sulfur heating oil, the solvency aspects of biodiesel, producing fewer uh, fuel-related issues, cutting down on service calls. Anybody here making money on service contracts? No, no, so, that, so that's a pretty significant benefit of it uh, to, to, the consum to, to, to our consumers. And as, as we've heard, a, a really great grain fuel. Um, the value of the B ASTM B20 balloting, where ASTM could recognize blends of B20 uh, in heating oil, Many people in the room right now are doing this on a regular basis and having a lot of success. Increased competition within the gallon. That's what's happening with biodiesel blending. We're seeing competition within the heating oil gallon. This past year, we've seen better than NYMEX economics for, for, for our heating oil gallon. And that's largely due to, to, to and, and in turn, making our gallon more competitive. So as we move to, to higher blends, uh, if these discounts kind of continue or as they have over the last couple of years, right now we don't happen to be in really one of those modes, but that's, pr that's producing new opportunities for us. It's also changing the supply picture a little bit. Uh, as we touched on, it is, it is a margin maker for a lot of your businesses now where depending on where the biodiesel might be on a B20 blend, you may be able to bank two cents, three cents a gallon uh, over your, your entire heating system, which, you know, being a former distributor myself, there were years we couldn't make two, three cents a gallon. So these are some values that sometimes can be banked going into the season. And I think now, more than anything else, we need to have some kind of, you know, defense, or as I like to say, offense, against natural gas conversions, and not be so quick just to concede the fact that our fuel may not be competitive today, but having something to go on the offensive with, whether it be, as was spoken about today, the, ta the New York State tax incentive, whether or not it's, it's some better economics, but also telling the story ab about biodiesel and some of these opportunities and, and, and having some talking points to utilize uh, when you're having conversations, if it's with a customer, if it's with a co-op, whatever the case may be. To know where we want to go with our business, I think it's fair to take a look back to kind of let us kind of chart a path of where we're going. And I kind of look at it over, over the last 10 years. Just to kind of give a little synopsis as we say, see that top bullet, in 2013, the U.S. produced over 1.8 billion gallons of biodiesel. Just to provide a little market perspective, 10 years ago, the U.S. produced somewhere between 15 and 20 million gallons of biodiesel. So in a very short 10 year period, the growth has been meteoric as far as the growth of this industry. Nora's goals, and they're now, they're, they're now top goal, as John just pointed out, was integrating biodiesel in, into, their, into their business plan as their top priority. 10 years ago, the word biodiesel wouldn't have shown up on, on a lot of, of Nora's materials. Now it's number one. And because of that, oil heat is now sending 
a much stronger message to the other energy, to the energy markets in general, that we've got a, a new fuel, a better fuel, a new fuel to market, and that we're just not going to lay over and die, as I think some people might think that that was going to be our natural course. And lastly, re, the, the opportunity over the last 10 years to reintroduce your company to neighboring communities. So many of your companies are, are family businesses, multi-generation, 50, 75, 100 years old, and they know you, they know you in the community, but this gives you an opportunity to reintroduce yourself. Maybe some of those core values that have, in, in our own business, have just kind of settled in. This gives us an, a new opportunity to talk about some of those great things we do. You know, as I always like to do in, in, in one of these sessions, you know, how many of us have keys to our customers' homes in their offices? Right. How many of you have your house keys in somebody else's office? Pretty powerful stuff. That's who we are. And th it's that message, not just biodiesel, but biodiesel gives us that opportunity to retell that message, to, re to, to, to recreate that trust again. Just a little top, uh, for those of you who, we, we've heard the word RFS mentioned a couple of times today. For those of you who aren't particularly familiar with what it is, it's, it's the Renewable Fuel Standard. And this is the second version of the Renewable Fuel Standard that came out. It uh, requires a ramp up of 36 billion gallons of renewable fuel by 2022. In four nested volume mandates, renewable fuel, advanced biofuel, biomass based diesel, and cellulosic biofuel. Biodiesel is included as an advanced biofuel uh, and in the biomass-based diesel category. It actually generates a D4 RIN and a D5 RIN. The RFS2 program, which was initially set up and, and, and was set up to improve air quality within our transportation fuels, also included some other industries uh, to participate in the program, most notably jet fuel and home heating oil. To give some kind of a benchmark of of where this proposed ruling has been. On the biomass-based diesel portion, which is largely biodiesel and some renewable diesel, in 2011, the volume obligation was 800 million gallons. And that's pretty significant because coming out of 2009, there was no federal tax incentive. And up until that time, we had never, blend, we the biodiesel industry, had never blended much more than 400 million gallons. So this was a very lofty goal in 2011 and not only did the biodiesel industry hit the 800 million gallons, it actually produced over a billion gallons that year. 2012, the obligation was a billion, and again, it was exceeded in the, bi in the biodiesel category. In 2013, last year, the volume obligation was 1.28 billion gallons, and as we saw in the previous sli slide, the biodiesel industry produced 1.8 billion gallons. So the biodiesel, the D4 category, has really been the star of the RFS, the, the RFS2. Uh, the the uh, cellulosic uh, uh, biofuel, for example, has not been able to hit its, its mandates. It hasn't reached the commercial scale. But one of the issues that the industry is facing currently is the, uh, the EPA did not raise that level in 2014. As a matter of fact, their, their initial indication was that they were going to keep the uh, volume obligation at 1.28 uh, billion gallons, which was a real hit to the biodiesel industry because they were starting to really make some headway and people were making investments into production and distribution and the like. So this is what's proposed. We're hoping to hear sometime this summer whether or not that value may be raised. Uh, the EPA's administrator, Gina McCarthy, has hinted around the fact that some changes need to be made. And if we see that, we may see a bump in RIN pricing. And when we see a bump in rim pricing, the, the effect is a discount biodiesel gallon to the marketplace. So that's something that we're looking for and hopefully will, be, will come out sometime this summer. Just to kind of give a benchmark of where we are to date so far, uh, in 2014, as of May, the numbers that came into May, the industry has produced uh, 626 million gallons, which would leave a, a, a balance of 600 and 53 million, uh, 653, or 654 rounded up, for the rest of the year. So at this point in time, the industry is already ahead of schedule. 
Forgive uh, the, uh, this, this omission here on the D4 EM, EMTS data 2013. This information came from the Jacobson. It, it, it came out that way, but I thought, it, so I apologize. It is 2014. It was, a, it was a typo on the Jacobson. But what these lines do represent is the, the volume produced and the RIN levels moving so far from January through May. And as you see, with the exception of the month of January, the, uh, the, both the RINs in the, uh, in, the, in the blue category and the, and the biomass-based diesel in the red category are hit, hit their targets in February and then started to really exceed their targets as we moved into March, April, and May. So the industry is, is moving forward in a very good place. What we've seen over the last couple of years, we used to see kind of differences in some of the RIN values uh, but in the RIN separation process, without getting too deep into the weeds, the RINs can be somewhat interchangeable as, as they're peeled off. So what we're seeing is a much closer trend in the RIN activity between the D4, the D5, and the D6 categories as we look at this over a, a year's period of time. They kind of move together. Uh, another factor that impacts the pricing of biodiesel is what's called the hobo spread, or the heating oil to bean oil spread, and essentially what this is, is what is a, 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 a gallon of so, a typically soybean oil benchmarked against the NYMEX heating oil contract. So as we've seen, uh, uh, going back to June of last year, the, the soybean oil uh, contract was trading at a premium of, of 62 cents or so, 65 cents to the heating oil, and then as the year went on, we saw a decline, whereas we got down into January and February, we saw it trading at a discount. The lower the bean oil costs, the lower the cost of the biodiesel as we blend it with biodiesel. So this is another factor that has some impact in our markets. So as we look back at 2013, it was a great year. I, I, I love that picture of Tom Cruise. For those of you who haven't seen Jerry Maguire, it's one of the great scenes in the movie when he's losing his client base and he's saying to his, cl his client, you know, show me the money. That's kind of how I think we feel sometimes when we're having conversations with our customers, you're having them with yours. It's all about price, price, price. Well, it was a pretty good year in 2013. Why? We had a full year of the biodiesel blenders tax credit, which provides a dollar uh, for every gallon of biodiesel blended with heating oil or diesel fuel. We had a pretty strong year on the D4 RIN category, which helped the prices down. As we saw over the last graph, a very favorable hobo spread that went throughout the year, which in turn created strong biodiesel uh, blending economics, which presented uh, many people in this room and, and those who, some, some nice opportunities to bank some margin in what was a nice strong heating season. So as we move into 2014, it's uncertain. But as we went into 2013, it was uncertain. We didn't have the tax credit. And, and, and the point being that, you know, as this industry has kind of gone and it evolved, it's been this kind of a, of a market. But if you chart it over 10 years, we see where the market kind of goes. So we come into 2014. We're not quite sure what that RVO is going to be. Is it going to be at 1.28 billion gallons or not? We're not sure. We're not sure whether or not the biodiesel tax, uh, uh, federal tax incentive is going to be reinstated. Uh, the, the, the thinking right now is it's not going to be done prior to the elections, and its best hope for being reinstituted is uh, after the midterm elections within the lame duck session of Congress, lumped in with about 50 other tax extenders at the same time. We're, op we're optimistic, cautiously optimistic, that that'll occur. Um, and biodiesel production, as we, we showed before, is running above it. So, you know, as we're sitting on our rock there by ourselves, what are we going to do? I think as, the program, as we can kind of think about this, biodiesel is a program. We need to understand, obviously, the, the, the financial moves in the market and how it impacts our business. But I think as we look at this a little broader and a little longer, we'll see that being in the program is going to produce a lot more profits than not. We touched on this a little bit, but for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, New York State has a biodiesel heating oil tax credit called the Refundable Clean Heating Fuel Tax. The value of the tax credit is equal to one 
penny per gallon for each percent of biodiesel blended with conventional home heating oil, up to a maximum of 20 cents per gallon. So in essence, if we have a, a, a customer who, who burns 1,000 gallons and they're using a B20 blend throughout the year, they will be entitled to a $200 refund on their personal taxes. For those in the audience who are utilizing, and I think they would agree, it is one of the all-time great retention strategies that you can have for your customer base because you're bringing it to them. In some cases, our customers are sending out the tax forms to their customer, how to file for it, how to go about it, accounting instructions and the like. It's there, it's a home run. If you're not doing it, you're hurting yourself immeasurably on the retention. It's the all-time great retention strategy. The, the, the credit is also valid in use in buildings, both residential and non-residential space, and a common storage tank is eligible for a partial credit based on the allowable, uh, based on the percentage of square footage used for residential purposes. If a taxpayer's allowable credit exceeds their tax liability for a given year, the remaining credit is refunded rather than carried over to a subsequent tax year. So if you have co-ops, commercial buildings and the like, they're eligible for the program. If you have any questions, with, see me afterwards and, and we'll get you the information on it. Uh, I think John highlighted this as well. Mayor Bloomberg in September of 2013 uh, signed into uh, legislation uh, for biodiesel and all this, uh, the city's fleets and vehicles. Um, as John kind of alluded to, it's introductory number 1061 that allows all diesel vehicles blended with biodiesel uh, a 5% uh, going into 2014 and a 20% going into 2016. Uh, we're seeing some of the city vehicles utilizing this prior to this. So the city of New York is behind it. We're seeing it also for those of you who are distributing diesel. It's another good bastion of, of market opportunities for you to grow your business if you're in the program. <clears throat> this doesn't apply to most people in this room because you are, you're here, you're, you're, if you're not blending biodiesel right now, you're obviously very curious about it, but we do see a lot of dealers, we do see a lot of distributors, and there's a lot of what I would call uh, maybe, maybe, maybe uncertainties, maybe a little fear as far as how they grow their business. And a lot of times it's a case of not having a plan and I think biodiesel can be a basis for your business plan moving forward that you can really innovate around. You know, for, for, for some of the folks that we talk to, you know, one of the, who are a little skeptical about the program, one of the things that they'll say is, nobody's asking for it, you know? It's mandated, but none of my customers ask for it. They don't ask for it because they're not aware of it. And it's our job as marketer to kind of to speak to them about that. But I, I, I thought for those who, who might kind of think in those terms, just kind of show, this is a survey that was done by the National Biodiesel Board, and they've been sampling both consumers and registered voters for the past 10 years. And if we look at June 2004, when asked about their awareness of biodiesel, only 27% of those sampled uh, said yes, we had heard of it, and 73% no, they had not. As we move up to registered voters in October of 2013, 81% had heard of it and 19% had not heard of it. So the nomenclature, the word, the awareness of it is growing, but that doesn't mean that the consumer necessarily understands what that benefit can mean to them. But when asked, and again, this is coming from MBB, their, their opinion about biodiesel, whether or not they're positive or negative, if you look at the pies on the right, specifically the positive to the negative, we see almost a 10 to 1 ratio of positive versus negative, and 5% as any kind of negative in any survey is really a, a remarkably low number to hear. Obviously, the 12% that don't know, and 38% don't have an opinion. Perhaps that's because they're not that familiar with it. Perhaps the question of price wasn't entered into the equation, and they reserved it. But clearly the general public is, their feelings on biodiesel is, is, are growing and they're more positive. So if, if you needed some reaffirmation about what, your, what the consumers and what their feelings might be about it, it tends to be very positive. 
So what, and Seth touched on this very, very well uh, in his presentation. I think what we kind of have found our sweet spot at, at Amerigreen is understanding the strategic partnerships to be able to carry a successful biodiesel program all the way through. And it's working with biodiesel producers. It's making sure we have fuel at petro petroleum terminals, that we're, we're, we're talking and, and, and meeting and, and having great conversations with oil heat distributors about the benefits. And the last piece of it is messaging this message to your customers and to the consumer or what we kind of like to call connecting the dots along the way for, for an effective program. Um, when we talk about biodiesel and it as a program, it starts with quality. And the National Biodiesel Board, some 10 plus years ago, created what's called the BQ9000 program. It's a voluntary program, it's not a federal or a state program. And the idea is to ensure quality throughout the supply chain. There are three designations. There's the uh, producer program, the marketer program, and the lab program. Uh, the BQ9000 producer is a category for companies that produce biodiesel fuel. The fuel must meet its ASTM 6751 standard to be legally defined as biodiesel. The program ensures a, a production company is using a system for monitoring uh, quality throughout their biodiesel, and this involves a lot of record keeping, testing, and the like. There's a BQ9000 marketer category. This category is for distribution companies who sell biodiesel and biodiesel blends. This is an important designation because proper handling of biodiesel is critical to fuel quality as proper production. Amerigreen Energy is a BQ9000 marketer, and we source biodiesel from BQ9000 producers. Because at the end of the day, and the, what we've learned over the, ten, the 10 years, is if we can deliver a quality gallon of biodiesel to you, you are going to see the, 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 these, the, the, you are going to find these positive effects that we highlighted earlier in the program. Not all, not all biodiesel is the same. What we really try to focus on is low cloud, low mono biodiesel in the winter time so that our outside tanks don't have any issues. Uh, the, the cloud point of our biodiesel that we try to distribute, our high limitation is, is a plus two, but a lot of what we've been distributing in New York Harbor this, this past season has been anywhere from plus one to minus two. And we, we, our customers have let us know that they have found very little to no effects through what has been a very problematic winter. Just a little highlight on some of our locations within the Mid-Atlantic and the nor Northeast and our supply strength. We are a complete wholesale energy supplier and business resource. We have diversified supply relationships with multiple BQ9000 uh, producers. One of the real strengths in us being able to, to provide great economics is the functionality and the number of the producers that we work with. Within the biodiesel community, if you talk to traders, they talk about Amerigreen as being the great biodiesel short because we can move the gallons. Because of that, as gallons become available, Jason, Mike Murphy, and the logistics department do a phenomenal job of being able to source these and allow us to, the functionality to really be able to be dynamic in our sales approach. This high volume purchasing ensures competitive pricing. Our hands-on approach in su supporting our fuel de dealer network to sustainably grow their organizations. You know, as Seth had kind of touched on, he came out of the heating oil business. That's what American Steve talked about, the fact that he grew up in the heating oil business. I grew up in the heating oil business as a family business. That's where we come at it, and that's what we're trying to, to, to provide to our distributors, that value-added, value hands-on approach. And because of the number of distributors that we have, we're able to learn as much as we're able to provide information because we see, we see what's working in, in different parts of the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. Our logistical strength, you know, it's, it was 25, as Seth sp uh, said this morning, it's now about 50 uh, internal fleet of transports. Uh, and uh, uh, we, Jason and Mike have created some really dynamic relationships with some, of, with, with, with some transports company, uh, companies within the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast region. We will rail biodiesel in if you're on a rail spur. 
A lot of what we did this year in New York Harbor was moving biodiesel around by barge. Um, and we have procurement locations in New Jersey, the Bronx, uh, and, and are able, to, and, and as we move into the summer, we're hopefully going to have a few, a few additional uh, locations as well. Our Amerigreen branded distributors program is, is something that some of you here are, are, are branded distributors. And what we try to do is, is, is provide brand marketing similar to what you might see on some of the gasoline and other branded marketing. Um, a little bit about you know, some of the, 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 the other services that we can provide to your business. Uh, we also have, uh, we do a nice job on the risk management side. Holly DeVries is here. She handles all of our CAP programs our, uh, for, for us. We're actually doing a quite a bit right now in the propane side of, of, of CAP programs. Uh, we can provide fixed dif differentials to you on the biodiesel side, spot pricing, and one of the programs that we had a lot of success with this year were contract strips that ran from October to April. And again, our distributors were able to bank a, a lot of that value into their business plan before it ever got cold. Uh, our creative marketing services team Aubrey Kreider and Doug May do a phenomenal job in being able to message not only Amerigreen, but messaging down to your clients as well, your customers, uh, in, a ver in a very personal way, um, and message directly to your customers. You know, again, we try to cultivate an in-depth business relationship with our distributors who have a passion to grow their business with a value-added uh, partnering or consulting in business tactics that perpetuates the sustainable relationships. You know, we, because we came out of the heating oil space, we feel an, an akin to it. Your business becomes our business. It's very personal to us. We, we, we want to grow your gallons. That's something that really, at the end of the day, is our success. If we can grow your gallons, it's going to grow our gallons. That's kind of our charge and what we're trying to do. So, John, Steve asked John a little earlier about the New York City biodiesel mandate and kind of what's changed. In, 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 look, in talking to dealers uh, in New York City, you know, what, what my kind of takeaway is they kind of fall into three categories. The first is those distributors who are going to comply with the mandate. We're bioheat distributors. We comply with the mandate. It's 2%. We're doing it. But that's it. They're not telling their customers anything about biodiesel, bioheat, or the like. They're just going to comply. Others will take advantage of the, feed, the, the feedstock economics or the biodiesel economics when they present themselves in the marketplace. So if we're seeing blending economics, we'll get in. If we don't see them, we may not get in. But, but in, in most of those cases, we don't see those distributors marketing bioheat and biodiesel as a business practice and kind of missing the boat because they don't want to have a start again, stop again kind of relationship with the customer. So they'd rather arb the biodiesel Keep the, mar keep the margins and go, go about it that way, doing it as business as usual. And then there's that third category. Those marketers have, who have seen the value in the biodiesel gallon and see it as an opportunity to recreate their business plan into a 21st renewable century renewable energy provider. And these are the companies that we're seeing are having a lot of success. Not just because they're buying more biodiesel. When we walk into the offices, we see a spring, we see an enthusiasm, we see a little passion that we don't see in some of these other offices that are marketing it in the same way, as the same old. And that's a significant aspect. It's not just what you can do as far as down to your customer, but the opportunities to re-engage your, your staff as well. The, ind the independent bioheat energy marketer has a plan. The first part of this is making a commitment to biodiesel as a marketing constant in the business plan. Whether or not the ARB is there or the ARB is not there, they're marketing bioheat and they're marketing biodiesel and they're utilizing this as the platform to launch every other product and service and put a very positive face on their company, reintroducing it as a renewable energy provider. Not your grandfather's heating oil company anymore. Finding the right blending balance for your company in the marketplace. There is no right size that, that, that fits everybody. Most people who move into this may start with a 2% or a 5%, and then they may look at, feel very comfortable about it from a service standpoint, 
and then start to push the envelope and the tens and the twenties and then that's typically how this kind of moves up and what do they see? Cleaner heat exchangers, cleaner nozzles, cleaner fil filters, lower service costs. One of, one of the, the real interesting things that I found with a dealer up in New England, we were talking about biodiesel and unbeknownst to me, he had been using B20 for the last uh, two years, which kind of surprised me because he never said anything to us about it. And the reason why he was in the camp of I'm gonna keep it quiet, his customers didn't even know. But he was taking advantage of the ARB, that's why he was in it. But what he found out was those clean heat exchangers got to the point where the techs just left the vacs of the shop. They weren't taking them anymore. He was starting to do calcs on the service benefits and how that was coming back to him. And so he kind of saw this as more as a value added additive that was reducing the service cost. Going into it for the ARB really got, got bought into it because of the service benefits. Providing an alternative to natural gas conversions. Keep the gallons, don't just let them walk out the door forever. You know, as, as we've transitioned in New York from six to four and four to two, what we've seen in a lot of our business plans is, am I, is this now the onus for me to pull the tank and, and move to natural gas? And it was touched on earlier, you know what? Well, maybe we can at least get the conversion. You know, one of the things that AmeriGreen is doing with our distributors is if you have a co-op, if you have a, a, a buying group, if you have somebody that's thinking in those terms, we'll come and we'll set up a meeting. We'll talk with them. We'll, 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 we'll point out the value of the tax incentive, the value of biodiesel and what it means. And to this date, we haven't lost one to natural gas. That's not to say we can't. We recognize that natural gas is less expensive today. But remember, if we go back 25 years, 18 of those years, we had, the, we had the cheaper fuel, yet they still grew a market share. It's about marketing. We talk about ourselves as marketers. It's about marketing. It's about conveying that message. It's about playing offense and not always feeling like you're on the defensive on this argument. Be proud of what you're marketing. Again, you have the keys to their homes. The gas company does not. Biodiesel marketing's fun. I mean, we, we, we've seen some marketers really embrace it to the fact where they, they recreate themselves. Seth cre created AmeriGreen Energy out of this and saw a real business opportunity to do that. And it is good business and you can have some fun with it. A lot of fun with it. The messaging is easy. The independent bioheat energy marketer has the freedom to be able to message to a very diverse consumer demographic. Successful biodiesel marketing comes from a place of confidence, conviction, and purpose from the distributor to the consumer that they are marketing. We have the messaging at AmeriGreen. We're not asking you to recreate it. We, 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 we'll, we'll work with you to help it tie into your messaging, but the message, messaging is here. All you need to do is be the messenger to, to, to your customers to lock them into your program and to put that thought in their mind that natural gas conversions is not necessarily a de facto where they have to go. Provide that option, provide that messaging. Our, our, our bioheat distributors we, we're, that we're working with now, one of the things that we're providing as, as value add are these uh, statement stuff for inserts that Doug and Aubrey have created, providing different messaging. The next generation thanks you. Speaking a little bit about some of the basics of biodiesel. We have our brand and then we have our distributor's brand on it and their address as well. Bioheating oil versus natural gas. Again, something that we can, you can drop into your mailings, that they can open and just see that. So instead of them calling, we've made the decision to convert, have that conversation with them in advance of that. Don't be afraid to do that. Go on the offensive with this. In 2013, American fuel companies displaced nearly 2 billion gallons of diesel fuel and heating oil by blending American-made biodiesel into their fuels. And lastly, and I think a great messaging, particularly within New York, biodiesel reduces emissions causing respiratory diseases in children. We provided these free to our distributors this year who are, who are in the program. Again, how can we help grow your gallons? If, you grow, if your gallons grow, our gallons grow. 
key distributor points and benefits, biodiesel marketing begins at home. I kind of think there's a three-legged three stool approach to, to biodiesel marketing within a company. I think it first starts with company training, making sure everybody's familiar with what biodiesel, what biodiesel's all about, debunking some of the myths that they make here in the supply houses along the way. We'll come into your office. We'll work with, with if, if you want to bring your staff in, if you want to set something up at night and make it a team building exercise, we'll come down and we'll talk to them about biodiesel and make them feel very comfortable about the fuel. We'll have a Q&A. You want to bring your techs in? You, or, they're, they're the people that it's really critical to get on board and they're going to ask some good questions. And the, the documentation that Dr. Butcher spo spoke about with higher blends and adjusting the oxygen level, those kinds of things. We can have those conversations with them and again, share some of our best practices, what has worked, worked well. But at the end of the day, there really is very little to no change in service protocols that have to be provided, but we will have that open conversation with them. Customer education, and then finally, consumer awareness. Key consumer points of interest, the fuel performance, the fact that biodiesel is a great lubricity additive and is a solvent, the environmental benefits at B20 blends, having a similar or better profile than natural gas, and the fact that it's a domestically produced renewable energy. And some of the opportunities that come out of building these bridges is a organizational team building opportunity. You'll find people start to get a little pumped up about it. I mean, think about it. I'm an oil company, I'm a renewable energy provider, and you can get them to kind of think in those kinds of terms. It's kind of fun. Uh, partic you know, I, I think for all people in the, the, the industry, and as you start to market this in, into, into your neighborhoods and into your demographic areas, you're going to be seen as an industry leader. You're evolving. You're ma making this next step into renewables. Again, a very positive message that you can provide to them. And lastly, the opportunity to be your own testimonial. Biodiesel marketing is going to open up some doors as you get the word out that you may not find otherwise. You may be asked to speak at chambers of commerce. You may be asked to speak about it at a rotary. You may be asked to participate in Earth Day. How many a heating oil distributors have ever been in, invited to participate in Earth Day? These are the kind of opportunities that you can leverage to grow these gallons. Again, finding that value within the biodiesel gallon. I think the company training is, 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 is very essential. You know, we, we haven't seen many programs fail. But, if, but if, we, if we've seen mixed results, a lot of times it's the fact that not everybody understands the messaging. Not everybody is comfortable and confident about speaking about biodiesel. So again, if, the, if, if we haven't been in your office, if this, isn't, if this is something that you're thinking about, we're, what, we're more than happy to come in and, and, and talk to your people about moving in this direction. You know, we, 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 like yourselves, don't like to, to, to kind of toot our own horn, but we do have certain core customer values, and it's to develop and maintain a hands-on approach and trust within our distributors. We're looking, we're looking for and preparing to take advantage of market opportunities when they present themselves, staying in touch as these economics come and, and they go, helping distributors devise sustainable business plans and institute growth strategies within your company, and collaborate inside the distributor's company and educate employee, employees on new energy technologies, tax incentives, and, and customer service strategies. Again, oftentimes when we're in office, we're talking about biodiesel, but for Ron Flick and Steve McCracken and Seth Obitz and myself, we're heating oil guys. Oftentimes, we'll be talking about some other things. What have you found that's worked in other people's businesses? These are the kind of value-added tactics that we like to be able to bring to your business. And lastly, I think that you know, we, we, we heard our, our state execs talking about mandates, and mandates are great, but whether or not we have a, your, your company is in a mandated market or not, it's kind of irrelevant. The companies that are having successful, successful biodiesel marketing programs, there's an entrepreneurial spirit. There's a gene that's kind of in there to try to recreate the mousetrap. And sometimes that's scary. And sometimes it feels like the deck is stacked against you. You know, I put the picture there of Richard Seymour in, in, in 2008 in the Super Bowl when the New England Patriots were a double-digit uh, uh, 
uh, favorite to beat the, the New York Giants. They were trying to be, break the Miami Dolphins record and go 19-0. and The spread, they had the greatest offense that anybody had seen in the NFL, but the Giants played an outstanding defense. And in the fourth quarter, Eli Manning, who's certainly not regarded as a great athlete, would not go down. He got out of the hands of Seymour, he got free, he threw a pass down to David Tyree, who caught it on his helmet, kept the drive going, and three plays later threw an out pattern to Plaxico Burst to put the Giants ahead and upset them. I think that's sometimes how we may feel sometimes in our offices in the odds that we're fighting against. What we're saying within the value of this biodiesel gallon is don't go down. Play offense. Embrace this. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's thinking about it a little differently that makes the opportunity, and it's liberating to think like an entrepreneur and think in these, ter these terms. There is no one playbook for how this is going to work for your business. It works within your business and what you're doing successfully. Some of the long-term benefits, biodiesel marketing equals su 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 sustainable success. The rebranding of a 20th century oil company into an advanced renewable liquid fuel marketer for the 21st century. Setting bioheat marketers apart from the other oil companies and energy providers. Customer loyalty. Why would I stop using bioheat when I'm in the program? And building the bridge for today's kids, which become tomorrow's customers. This slide is 10 years old. It's the first slide of the first presentation that I gave at the National Biodiesel Board Conference in 10 years ago in Fort Lauderdale. It hasn't changed. Building the biodiesel bridge is more than just blending D3, uh, D396 heating oil into 6751. It's building a bridge, a, a new bridge, within your communities. It's building a new bridge within your organization to kind of change the mindset and move it forward. It's building a bridge for those of you who are in family businesses and realistically look at it and say, my mother or father passed this down to me. Is this something that I can now pass down to my next generation? Is this business plan going to be viable? And most importantly, we're building the bio hit the biodiesel bridge between our company and our customer and reinforcing that great relationship that we've developed along the way. With that, be happy to answer any questions that you may have or uh, on, on the marketing or the sales tactics that, that, that we have with Amerigree. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yeah, definitely some powerful stuff. And, um, you know, being firsthand a part of it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to see it and see it come to fruition. What are some of the challenges you've seen from the education side of things with uh, service techs, drivers, customer service reps, you know, challenges of adoption and getting people who've been doing this for, you know, for decades upon decades and now suddenly this new thing? I think, I think the, 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 the group that has the greatest challenge initially is, is those in the service department. And I think that spending some time uh, talking to them is, is kind of essential, making them feel comfortable, because there is a lot of misnomers, and typically they come out of the supply houses as far as what biodiesel is doing. And there has been some bad experiences with biodiesel over the last five years. I mean, as, as it was rolling out, it was kind of a free-for-all. We saw all different kinds of feedstocks make their way to markets. And, 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 and oftentimes we'll see biodiesel producers trying to, to market a biodiesel that works very well for ExxonMobil in, in, in the southeast, but really doesn't fit well in northeast heating oil. So, so that's one of the challenges that I think that we kind of have to look at in talking to those techs a little bit about you know, what's important, the cloud, the monos. There are no changes to service protocols. But I think having that uh, honest dialogue is critical because they are the quality control people that we have in the field. And if we don't take the time to take them through uh, what biodiesel is all about and provide a top line education, when they go out and there's a problem and there's a clog filter, it's the biodiesel. And so I think that once we get them into the program and, and that education is done, Steve, then I think they become great advocates within our company. Well, I dare somebody ask him a question. 
I asked him. Any questions uh, from the group? Any questions regarding the market, biodiesel market, things along the, uh, those lines? Letting them off easy. <laughs> we had a lot discussed today. Oh, yep, go ahead, Tom. Question here. Do you have any idea how much of the biodiesel that's produced in the U.S. goes into heating versus diesel? It's a great question, Tom. Uh, we we it's a, and it's a question that's that that's been asked a lot by NBB. You know, is there any way to track that? And the answer is no. Th th there 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 is no way to track it. Um, I, I in looking at for, for example, your slide that you 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 put up uh, a few minutes ago, the number of, of customers I think it was ten thousand and so that were using B B twenty blends. Uh, in, in the survey you done. In this room this last year, I would say that we probably had close, just from the people sitting here, close to 70 to 80,000 customers that were utilizing B20 blends. So I think as when the, when, the, when the economics are favorable to biodiesel, I think the large majority of all, all of the heating oil that's going to be distributed is going to have close to 5% of biodiesel in it. Um, so that number could be close to three to 400 uh, million gallons. If, if we take into account the higher blending now, again, it's anecdotal, it's a guess. Could it be 600 uh, you know, million gallons? It could be, Five million, 500 million, somewhere in that. But there's no reporting or anything along those lines to substantiate it. Uh, Michael. Uh Couple questions here. Um, one, the the B nine thousand, BQ nine thousand, B two nine thousand, BQ. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, does that have any uh, um, correlation with feedstock? Uh, does that uh, is there any distinction of that qualification having to do with uh, uh, soy based or feedstock different differences? It doesn't, Gary. It's it, it's 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 certifying ASTM D sixty seven fifty one is carried throughout the supply chain. So with re it, it'll have some, you know, it. Again, it, in a lot of parts in the U.S., cloud point isn't really much of an issue. You know, in the southeast, it's not much of an issue. On the west coast, you know, south of of, of uh, San Francisco, it's not much of an issue. So ASTM hasn't really gotten into cloud per se. It's something that the distributor needs to be mindful of, particularly in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic when they're, when they're purchasing biodiesel. You know, just as you had mentioned a due diligence on your cloud services, it's the same principle with, with biodiesel, cloud point, and monos. And it, it, it's pretty essential because you know, they're, they're, it, it's not as if there's some bad biodiesel that you could procure. You could just procure the wrong biodiesel at the wrong time of the season. But BQ9000 does not make that distinction in CloudPoint. All right, the second question I have is that uh, domestic production versus foreign production. And, and at one point, uh, uh, like New Haven Terminals, as an example, a lot of the blend stock there was uh, uh, predominantly palm oil that was shipped in from Malaysia. <coughs> um, what is the what is the relationship between foreign and domestic? Does anybody ke keep track of that? Yeah. And, and also, it's correlation, obviously, with the whole uh, theme of American-produced uh, products. Yeah. It, it, the, in 2013, about 600 million gallons of bio foreign biodiesel was imported into the U.S. And so it's, it is kind of a free-flowing market. We saw a higher level of imports this year this past year than we saw in the exports. And of course, we, we export a fair amount, nothing in, in, in that kind of uh, 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 degree that we saw last year. And, and if we look at that over, over a timeline, that was kind of an anomaly to see that amount come in. Uh, but with California and CARB, we're seeing renewable diesel come in. We're seeing biodiesel come in uh, from, from Asia Pacific uh, to fit some of those uh, mandates, and we saw some of it come into New York Harbor as well. So, you know, that, that was how it kind of broke down this year, which was kind of an anomaly, but still a, a, a big number. Yeah, Alan. Hi. I just wanted to thank you for uh, 
that that outlook of being a, more aggressive. We've been so passive as as an industry for so long. It's just a breath of fresh air, and it's it's, it's really invigorated me and inspired me to 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 go this way. And I wanted to thank you because it's nice to hear. I appreciate that. It's it, we, we again we all we want to do is our success is your success. This is a somewhat of a rhetorical question here, but does Amerigreen sell foreign uh, biofuel products? Uh, has has some come across? I mean, it, it, it might have, Gary. You know, I, I don't know. You know, a lot of it will depend on where we're pulling from. Our goal is, is has always been domestically uh, produced and sourced, and the vast majority of the biodiesel that, w that we market is. But I, I couldn't sit here and say, I, I'm not the right person to ask, but I can't, I can't say that none of, that gown, none of those gowns couldn't have found their way into our stream, because they might have. Any other questions? Yes, Michael. When to find as far as, you know, as properties and whatnot, are there others that are par or better than? As far as cloud is concerned? Um, just overall, I, cloud being one of them, but I'm not too um, spec-wise. Mm -hmm. kind of new to that. But I know from my department where I work, so I met the Lester is, you know, far and away the, the best type to get our hands on. And then are there others that I could, you know, go back with to recommend? Yeah, and again, a lot of this has to do with, 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 with where you are in the region. You know, there, there are some biodiesel feedstocks that may have a high cloud, but have a phenomenal cetane, uh, better than soy. But, but as far as the, the Northeast concern and the heating oil markets, soy is a phenomenal product. Canola is a phenomenal product. Actually, canola-based biodiesel has lower cloud properties than soy biodiesel di do does. So, you know, Amerigreen is, is taking a hard look at bringing in some of those products as we move into this winter. You know, what we're trying to do is, can we, can we improve it every year in the way in which we source it? Again, it comes back to our core values, and, and, and Jason and Mike do a great job on our operations side of really trying to beat those bushes down. So canola's a phenomenal. Um, uh, soy, is, uh, SME is phenomenal. Uh, as far as you know, winter using, again, more cloud-based. But there are some other good uh, d uh, distiller drain corn oil coming out of uh, the, 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 the ethanol refinery process can make a decent biodiesel. Um, and some, de depending on some of the, the, the waste vegetable oils that are collected can, can make a nice biodiesel as well. But it, for winter use, for heating oil use, the SME is the most prevalent and a pretty solid bet. 